You ain't getting out of the car. Now I can get out of the car now. Driving while intoxicated is dangerous, as it can claim someone's life or put others in dire danger. 52, From a police officer who broke the law while driving and claimed a young life. He also pled guilty to the felony of vehicular manslaughter in the second degree. And he also went to appeal. To a woman who regrets her misdeeds but knows it's useless. She caused Mr. Nyland's death. It's a terrible thing, the pain that she caused their family. Here are some cases where the court delivered perfect sentencing for these heinous criminals. Starting with a case where the police were supposed to be pillars of the community. But one fateful night, an officer's devastating actions shattered the public's trust in the most unimaginable way. Mr. Rush's plea to leave the scene of a fatal incident without reporting. The sentence the court is a minimum of two years to a maximum of six years to the New York State Department of Corrections. On the plea to vehicular manslaughter in the second degree, the sentence is the same. On March 21st, 2017, Officer Peter Rauch was driving a county-owned vehicle when he struck and killed 18 years old Seth Collier in Liverpool. He is now in court to face the outcome of his severe actions. The criminal stood solemnly in the courtroom, his head bowed as the judge read out his misdeeds and grave offenses. Count one is leaving the scene of a fatal incident without reporting, which is a class D felony. Are you willing to admit to me, sir, that I don't about March 21st of this year, at approximately 1.30 in the morning in the city of Syracuse, who operated a motor vehicle that is a blue 2010 Chevrolet Impala bearing the New York registration EWJ6671 in a southerly direction on North Salina Street, a public highway. And while operating such motor vehicle, you struck an 18-year-old male pedestrian, that being Seth Collier thereby causing Seth Collier to suffer serious and traumatic personal injuries that resulted in his death. And that you, knowing or having cause to know that you would cause such personal injuries, immediately left the location without stopping your vehicle to check on the condition of Seth Collier. And that you also failed to report the incident to the nearest police station as you are physically able to do so in violation of the vehicle and traffic law in the state of New York. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. How do you plead to that charge? Yes. The second count is vehicular manslaughter in the second degree, a class D felony. Are you willing to admit to me, Mr. Roush, that on or about the same date, March 21st, 2017, again, approximately 1.30 in the morning in the city of Syracuse, that you operated the same motor vehicle, a blue 2010 Chevrolet Impala, bearing that New York registration EWJ6671 in a southerly direction on North Salina Street, again, a public highway, while in an intoxicated condition. And as a result of such intoxication, you operated the motor vehicle in a manner that caused you to strike Seth Collier, thereby causing Seth Collier to suffer, suffer serious and traumatic injuries that resulted in his death. Is that true, sir? How do you plead to vehicular manslaughter in the second degree? I'm going to accept Mr. Rausch's plea to those two charges. You're satisfied, Mr. Oaks? Yeah. I'll accept the plea to those two charges. Mr. Rausch, here's how it works. I order a pre-sentence report. Probation will do an investigation. Cooperate with them while they're doing their investigation. You need to stay out of all trouble between now and the time of sentencing. You need to come back to court when we tell you. You do all those things. The worst sentence will be two to six years in state prison. At that time, I'll listen to the district attorney. I'll listen to anyone that he wants to have speak on his behalf. Any submissions that anyone wants to fi uh, file, I'll listen to those. I'll listen to Mr. Rossi, Mr. Sullivan, if Mr. Rausch wants to speak, and any other material. And of course, I'm going to consider the pre-sentence report. And at that time, the determination of the proper sentence uh, will be made. So you have to do those things that I just told you, Mr. Rausch, in order for me to live up to my end of the bargain. Sentencing date? November 17th. How's November 17th, Mr. Ross and Mr. Rose? The prosecutor not only highlighted the incident, but also pointed out the irresponsibility of this criminal. So his behavior isn't so wanton, or his operations are so wanton as we've seen in other cases, Your Honor. But what really makes this case offensive, truly what really calls out for an enhanced sentence, is his behavior after that collision, accepting that he didn't intend to cause this young man's death. Your Honor, I've watched the video, and you can see right up to the point of impact, 
and there's an area where you can see the impact of a closed circuit television. Not once at any point does Mr. Roush hit his brakes. There's not even a momentary hesitation where he hits his brakes and stops, and it's that moment of what do I do? There was no second thought about it. And that, Your Honors, what offends me the most? I've, I've talked to the man who was riding with Mr. Roush that day. This vehicle, the windshield was a spider web. Basically, the impact was right in front of the driver's windshield. The occupant says, yeah, we knew we hit something. Again, this isn't my area of the, area of the state where you're driving down a back road, maybe hit a deer, maybe hit an animal. You're driving down Salinas Street in the middle of the night, you need a good person. Not even a moment that he hesitate to say, should I stop? Should I see if they're okay? Should I call 911? His foot remained on the accelerator until he got to past times where he abandoned his vehicle and took off. I don't know whether Seth Callier would have lived had there been prompt immediate attention. Again, there was a woman in the area who was employed at a local establishment who walked down and called 911. So EMTs and first responders were there in approximately four minutes. So whether the defendant stopped or not, most likely Seth probably wasn't at live. His fate was still the moment of impact. But what's key here, Your Honors, the defendant didn't know that. The moment that he drove away, he didn't know if that young boy was still alive, if he was suffering in the street, if there was a chance of saving him. He was just completely indifferent. And it's that indifference that I'm asking the court to recognize today. His instinct was to protect himself, <coughs> not that boy. And I've never wanted to say to punish somebody because of their employment or being a public employee. I get those cases at times where a teacher gets a DWI or somebody working for the DPW steals a tool. People say, well, they're employed by the public. We pay their salary. They should be punished more harshly. And I say, look, they're people too. And I don't punish somebody simply because of who writes their checks for them. But this case is somewhat different, you know. This defendant was an investigator with the DA's office. It's not as though he's the teacher that does something off hours that's completely unrelated to her job or his job in the classroom. His job is public safety. His job 24-7 was public safety. And what makes it more offensive is he's driving a county vehicle. He's driving his DA investigator vehicle. He's carrying his county issue drug. He's carrying his badge. He has wrapped himself in the trappings of that office, in the vestiges of his position. And the question becomes, well, why is he driving the DA car? Why is he carrying his badge and his gun? And gun? We know the answer. So that if he does get stopped, he can flash his badge and ask for leniency so somebody can give him a break so he can invoke his title in the office to get special treatment. His conduct that night was such a betrayal of his position, his responsibility as a public officer, and as an investigator, that I think this court should take that into account when imposing this sentence. Talk to Mr. Sullivan the last couple days. Part of our conversation is, what are you doing the next day? That's the question everybody's asking everybody. Hey, you're traveling, what are you doing? I know what Mike and Lisa are doing next year. We're all going to get to go spend time with our families. We're all going to get to talk about benefits and the blessings we've had for this year. And they're going to look across the table in an empty chair. The prosecutor continued to explain the gravity of this crime. He presented logical arguments and evidence to the judge so that this criminal could not get out so easily. This defendant, through his selfishness, through his carelessness, he stripped that and stole that away from Shortly after this incident, Your Honor, I met Mike and Lisa in our home. I talked to him about the proposed disposition and that basically the most he could be charged with is a felony. 
And I said, ah, how is it only a few felony? Yes, that's, that's what the legislature has given us. That's what the legislature has given me as a police to work with, the courts to impose sentences. And I explained to them that the maximum sentence is 237. There, however much I or the court may wish to impose a more harsh sentence, we can't. We're limited by the rules that are put in place. And Lisa says it's not fair. How is it fair? Well, it's not. And none of us can pretend that it is fair. And she went to the other room, Your Honor, and she came in. She brought the wooden urn that Seth's remains are in. And set them on the table and said, this is how I get to see my son for the rest of his life, for the rest of my life. This sentence is not sufficient. Not because of court, not because of anything I've done, the legislature has tied our hands to say the most is 237. But when we're given this type of egregious conduct, when his BAC is at the upper limits of this offense, when he flees the scene to preserve himself with utter indifference to this victim, Your Honor, it calls for a 2 to 6 sentence. And I know that sentence is insufficient, it's inadequate. But Your Honor, today you can make sure that the sentence imposed is not insulting. And the only way for this family to not be insulted is to impose the sentence of two to six years. And I ask the court, and I respectfully ask the court to impose that sentence today. The defendant tried to derive the case in favor of his client. The judge, however, remained unwavering in his assessment. It's undisputed, Your Honor, that Peter Rausch has reflected on the facts of this accident and has lived with a terrible question since the day of the accident, that had he not been intoxicated, he may have reacted more quickly than he did at the moment of the accident. And on that basis, he has accepted responsibility in this courtroom for the accident. But there's more in this case, Your Honor, to this without reputation. I don't care whether you're a prosecutor, a citizen, a defense attorney, or anybody else. We ordinarily see something very different in vehicular manslaughter cases than from what happened here. There was no excessive speed. There was no erratic driving. There was no driving in the wrong lane. There was no driving on the sidewalk. There was a green light on which Mr. Rausch was proceeding. He was in his own lane and there was no recklessness. This was a tragic accident. And it is the result of so many things that are all matters of record. record. The darkness, the distraction of everybody, the inattentiveness caused by cell phones and the vagaries of life. At the center of this case today, before the court, is the fact that Peter Rauch left the scene. Everybody, there's always a little speculation in these matters. Let me speculate for a moment. If Peter hadn't left the scene, we might not even be here. That's the case. That's the question in this case. The question that, that drives everything in this case is the fact that Peter left the scene. It's not so much the actions that caused the tragedy, it's Peter's action in the aftermath of that tragedy. It's undisputed that Peter Rausch, without excuse and perhaps without rationality, left the scene of the accident. <clears throat> Leaving the scene of an accident like that never really carries with it the rational hope that anybody's going to avoid detection. Peter Rausch was in custody within a matter of hours after this accident, and he knew that that was inevitable. The accident occurred on a busy street where pedestrians were wandering around, and traffic was heavy even at that hour of the morning, and surely no one leaves the scene of an accident like that in the hopes or in order to avoid detection. It's an irrational response committed in a state of overwhelming panic in the midst of an inexplicable tragedy. And we can speculate forever as to what may or may not have happened if Peter had not left the scene in terms of the impact on the victim. On that question of impact, the timing of events is very instructive. Mr. Collier struck, I'm sorry, Mr. Collier was struck at 1.29 a.m. 
Within 45 seconds of that time, a person was on the scene. And a dispatcher was called, and uh, that call was received at 1.30 a.m., less than two minutes after the accident that occurred. By 1.39, one thir excuse me, by 1.34 and 39 seconds, an ambulance had arrived. That was four minutes after the call. Leaving the scene is inexplicable. It is an irrational reaction. It is a self-centered reaction. It is without explanation, but it's the way some people react in the moment of this kind of tragedy. And that way of reacting must be weighed against the balance of Peter's life. And the balance of Peter's life has been reflected in the correspondence that this court has received about the way in which he lives day in and day out. <laughs> To know Peter Rausch, Your Honor, is to recognize immediately that in his communications with others, he is not demonstrative. He's quiet, he's reserved, he doesn't sparkle, he's not a gladhander. His strength throughout his life has not been in the way he communicates, it's been in what he does. And what he has done for others all of his life is to spot a need and without any self-interest, without any interest in gaining recognition, without any interest other than in doing what is right, he has done what is right. As incredibly diff difficult as it is for Peter to be here this morning, he must indeed take some hope and some satisfaction in the spontaneous response of people from our community who are here to support him and who have supported him in their correspondence to the court. The courtroom fell silent as the criminal stood before the judge to receive his sentence. The judge, having carefully considered the arguments and the gravity of the situation, delivered the sentence. And their case is part of the behavior manslaughter, uh, a three year conditional interlock after the sentence is served. As I mentioned earlier, on September 8th, Mr. Roush pled guilty to leaving the scene of a fatal incident without reporting. He also pled guilty to the felony of vehicular manslaughter in the second degree, and he also waived appeal. The maximum sentence, as Mr. Rouse pointed out, in cases like this, deep felonies, would be two and one third to seven years in state prison. The parties agreed that through Mr. Rouse taking responsibility of both of these charges to cap, the maximum sentence would be a minimum of two to a maximum of six years. All options are open to the court this morning with regards to sentencing, and that was the uh, determination of all the parties. I do note, and I received a lot of information on this case. I know that Mr. Roush prior has had no, no record until this occurred. In the dates of March 20th going into March 21st, Mr. Roush was an outstanding citizen. He was a police officer in this county. He was employed by the Onondaga County District Attorney's Office as an investigator. I learned that he was engaged to be married, and I received uh, a lot of very informative information from the pre-sentence memorandum supplied to me by the defense. But I'd like to speak at this time about Seth Collier. There's not much that I could add or Mr. Oaks could add uh, more than uh, Ms. Burns told us, but during all the court proceedings, until there's a plea or a conviction after trial, the court focuses all its attention, and properly so, on the defendant. The court's job is to protect the defendant's rights, make sure that everything is done according to the law. But it's sentencing. That's the appropriate time to speak about the victim. And what I've learned is that Mr. Collier was 18 years old in March, when this occurred on March 21st, 2017. I learned that he was working full time, he had been for quite a while. Clearly, he was deeply loved by his family and his friends. And I learned that he was walking miles home from work one o'clock in the morning on March 21st. Someday, Mr. Rausch's sentence will be served. Someday, he'll be able to get on with his life. Someday, he'll be able to get married. Someday, possibly have children. Someday, he'll be able to be productive. But because of Mr. Rausch's actions on March 21st, 2017, Seth Collier will never get to do any of those things. 
because of Mr. Rauch's criminal behavior in that day, Seth Collier's life senseless he ended in a hospital bed two days later. I'll note that Mr. Rauch is not an average citizen. He's a trained police officer for greater than five years. He made a conscious decision on March 20th <coughs> to get drunk. There's no question about it. He was at three different bars. He had at least, that we know about, 16 alcoholic beverages with, as Mr. Oaks pointed out, a blood alcohol content of 0.18. Got behind the wheel of the car, but not just any car. The county-owned vehicle, the uh, vehicle, the district attorney's office, his investigator's car, which was equipped with a police radio. He had an indicia on him, all the police officer had gone, handcuffs, identification. There's no question that Mr. Rausch had the same duty as any police officer that comes into my courtroom and takes a stand and testifies and does the job that they do every single day. He had a duty to society, a special duty, a duty to protect his citizens. Instead, he got behind the wheel of the car over two times the legal limit for alcohol consumption. He struck down Seth Collier, and afterwards, there's no evidence that he break. There's no evidence that he hesitated. There was no calls on that police radio. Based on Mr. Rausch's own admission, he ran, he fled, he left this poor young man dying in the street. In the defense pre-sentence memorandum, it's noted to the effect that even if he had stopped, he could not have saved Seth Collier. Well, no. But certainly, Mr. Rausch did not know that when he fled. When he struck Seth Collier and when he fled, he did not know the condition that he was in. He was worried only about himself. Based upon everything that's been presented to this court about this case, all the input that I received, I found the following sentence to be the only appropriate sentence in this case. On Mr. Rausch's plea to leave the scene of a fatal incident without reporting, the sentence to the court is a minimum of two years to a maximum of six years to the New York Department of Corrections. On the plea to vehicular manslaughter in the second degree, the sentence is the same, a minimum of two years to a maximum of six years. They will run concurrent by law. With regards to the vehicular manslaughter, there's also a three-year conditional discharge with the admission interlocked device. Thank you very much. Teenage life is a time of exploration and growth, but what happens when it collides with unforeseen difficulties and life-changing events? But I'd ask the court consider those. With regard to the uh, hospital expenses, she certainly is volunteering to make restitution of all medical expenses that occurred as a result of this incident. On May 15, 2019, Dayla Lachey Wilson, an 18 years old, struck two children who were getting off a school bus in Ohio. She initially fled the scene after the incident, but later turned herself into the police. As the prosecutor laid out the details of the devastating incident, the gravity of this teenager's actions hung heavy in the air. The defendant has failed to show insurance. I assume that issue would be clarified and remind the counsel of that issue. The additional charge of passing the school bus in the 4511.75, that would be the state charge that. Uh, would carry a two-point violation and a $350 fine. Additionally, there is an additional court cost, and there would be the restitution to the various hospitals where the two children were taken for follow-up visitations, both being Lake West Hospital and Hillcrest. The uh, mother for Mason is here. She has been contacted by a victim advocate plus myself, and they are under subpoena today. The other boy, Scott, uh, his family's been contacted, but they had various other commitments to make. So uh, that's the recommendation to the court. Okay, what is the code section on the passing the stop school bus? The code section or the, 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 the state? The state will amend from the local and then the state right, and the right. account. So what uh, that, Your Honor, is 4511.75. Okay. Can you outline the facts here for me? This is the first pretrial on this, aside from carrying the blanket charges. Right. What happened? Well, apparently, uh, and not apparently, in our view, defendant uh, knowingly went across and around 
a school bus that was letting out a lighting, I guess he'd like that word, uh, two children from the bus, and they were passing in front of the bus. Uh, the driver, the, the school bus driver, was keenly aware of this suddenly and started blowing his horn and went out to try and stop it. Uh, in the meantime, the defendant went around the bus and hit the two kids. Uh, it was pretty serious. Were the children injured? You mentioned the they were injured. Uh, they were taken for evaluation. The mother for Mason is here, and she can explain to the court her view. She's a nurse. Uh, I talked to her. She's not in favor of this. She she has her personal views as to what should be done, um, and she's made a victim impact statement, which I think she may want to read, or she has for record, uh, wants to submit to the court. Uh, her child did get injured. The other child appears not to have any, any residue injuries. What were the injuries though? Pulse and bruises. Nothing elevating this to serious physical? No, otherwise it would be a felony charge. Me? Well, in my view, I That's what I would say. Okay. The victims and their families were deeply impacted by this horrific incident and expressed their reactions in court. The judge carefully listened to their statements. She needs to know that this is a mother's worst nightmare. This was my nightmare. <clears throat> to get a call like this while I'm on duty at work as a nurse at the Cleveland Clinic where she also worked. My son was coming home from school and we shouldn't, as parents, have to worry about anything like that when your son is getting off of a school bus. And after, <coughs> after this happened, I have been trying my hardest to be as strong as I can. Um, but it's been really hard. It's been really hard. I've missed, I, he's had to go to several doctor's appointments and then you know the fear of seeing a the fear of waiting for your child to show up at the hospital not knowing what to expect was the worst fear i could ever imagine i did not know what to expect i had no idea what was going on i got a call from a neighbor on my road and told me that my son was hit by a car and that they left the scene. And I, I couldn't hear anything else. It was just, she was screaming in the phone and I was just in pure panic immediately. I dropped everything. I couldn't even <coughs> sign off at work like we're supposed to. As a nurse, we're, you know, we, I, I couldn't think. I was in pure panic. Um, and whenever Mason showed up at the hospital, in a, uh, on a body board and in a cervical splint um, around his neck. He couldn't see me because he was, you know, they can't move. And um, I lost it, I lost it. His clothes were damaged, his, his clothes were ripped. He had dirt on his clothes, he had mud on his clothes, he had blood, um, he, his glasses were broken. Um, He was, and I finally was able to kind of sneak in there and grab his hand and like lean over to show him that I was there. And he, he kind of like went like this to see me. And I was like, hi baby, I'm here. And he's like, hi mom. And he just, one little tear came down his eye. I couldn't touch him until they cleared him. Um, she is so lucky that she didn't do more damage to either of the kids. Um, because I did, like I said, I don't understand how she can only be charged with misdemeanors. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I just, it's been a nightmare. It's been a nightmare. 
his doctor's appointments, the pain that he went through, he didn't just have bumps. He had scratches, he had bruises, yes, he had bumps. His clothes were ruined. He's going to counseling because of not being able to sleep at night. Um, he has anxiety. He has yet to get back on a school bus because he's afraid to. Um, I'm afraid to put him on a bus. And not saying that it's the bus driver or the bus's fault. I know it's not. But I'm scared out of my mind. And my mom and my fiance and my neighbors have been driving him when school was still in session. Missing, I'm missing work because I don't want to put him on a bus. I'm taking him to school, bringing him home from school, missing work. Um, there was one day I had to go pick him up from school because the, the, the teacher had to wheel him down in her wheelie chair, like her desk chair. He couldn't walk at all. He was in such severe pain, he couldn't walk at all and in tears. Um, uh, my older son has also suffered from this, <coughs> wondering why, who, why someone could do something like this to, to anybody. Um, I don't know. Um, he, he, he can't, he wasn't able to be a a, a seven-year-old boy for quite a while. He was in a lot of pain. He had a, he had a deep bruising. That's what he was diagnosed with. More witness testimonies were taken into account, possibly leading to a maximum punishment for this criminal. Our, one of our worst scenarios is a child getting hit on the crossing over. On that day, I had had two stops the, the two blocks prior to just dropping the kids off, crossing them over. Uh, and I'm always observing what's behind me. That's when, before you cross the kids over, you're looking in your rearview mirror, make sure there's nobody coming up behind. By the time I got to uh, 300th and Bar Jody, I let eight students off, but they were standing there, and I looked at my rearview mirror, my hands are still on my steering wheel, if you ever see the video. I haven't moved my hands to signal anything. And I saw this car coming up behind. We shoot was over a block away. And you could sense that there was, the car was not going to stop. And if anything, as she went by me, she was picking up speed. She wasn't slowing down at all. She wasn't even hesitating. And when I saw this, I like I started blowing the horn to, to get her attention and get the kids' attention. Scotty and uh, Mason, both seven girls, were horsing around a little bit, and they took off running across the street as she came by. They went flying through the air. They cleared. They were higher than her car when, when she hit them. They both were hit. They, they were both hit, yes. yes. Um, Mason, uh, Mason took the uh, brunt of the hit. Scotty was next to him. And they both went flying into the air and landed on the tree lawn. Before they hit the ground, she had her car in reverse. We backed up about five feet and then took off. Like I said, there, there was no hesitation. I, I, sl I stopped all her net when I hit a squirrel. I mean, it, it was ridiculous how fast she took off. She wasn't. She didn't care about anybody's life or anything else but her own life. Uh, I have, you know, at the time I'm I'm in the bus. I got 25 kids on the bus. They're going hysterical because they've all seen this. I can't get off the bus because I'm responsible for these kids on the bus. I see um, Mason laying there, you know, on the ground, non-responsive. Scotty got up and ran to his house. I can't do anything. The medics come. They're cutting. Mason's pants off, uh, they're putting him on a backboard. You know, I'm I'm totally freaked out with this whole thing. I mean, and like I said, she could care less if anybody died that day. All she had to do was worry about getting to work. And the thing is, any of the two streets prior to uh, coming up to the bus, if she had turned up those streets, they go the same way as the street that she turned down. There was no reason for her to even go by the bus. If, uh, it was just, uh, I, I, I can't fathom somebody being so and so ignorant to not even care about another person. Uh, that's about all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Were you going to present the video? No.
This is an upside. Yep. The defendant requested mercy, stating that his client was a young, first-time criminal who had made a terrible mistake. He urged to consider his client's age and rehabilitation before delivering the worst punishment. All right, Mr. Sweet, on behalf of your client. Thank you, Your Honor. I believe that Ms. Wilson will address the statement of how she feels coming out of this experience. And I think it's going to show remorse and great regret apologies directed specifically to the families involved, but the points that I need to make are that she's not a bad person, in that she was only six weeks into her 18th birthday and lacked a lot of experience that the rest of the folks here in the courtroom have with driving and making important decisions regarding safety. That's not a defense, that's just a perspective. Uh, when the incident happened, she was going through graduation week, and she did successfully graduate from high school, but it was quite a stressful situation for her because she's juggling one job and a kind of a part-time business, dog sitting, and it caused an emergency that day that she had to drop everything and attend to, and that's what put her in the car uh, driving home. Um, that's not a defense, it's just an explanation of the context. But my point is that she has some virtue. She has the work ethic and that she is employed nearly full time now with a major hospital in this town. And even more importantly, she has been working for several years, being a member of ROTC in high school, uh, to join the Army as a career. And it is her desire to uh, serve a career in the armed forces in the uh, medical profession, possibly nursing, and she is scheduled to, has been scheduled to uh, appear to begin testing for that program and then begin eight weeks of basic training uh, on or about July 30th. And I do have a letter from the uh, Army in that regard if I may submit that to the court. And she has been working with the recruiter's office and uh, knows the uh, sergeant that's in there, has known him for a number of years. And they like her a lot uh, because she has some virtue. She is not a loser, but she certainly made a catastrophic, sudden, bad decision, and maybe two bad decisions on the day and the time of this incident. And I think she'll remember this for the rest of her life reaction and the experience and how other people feel and that's certainly going to make a point on her thinking from now on. But I'd ask the court consider those. With regard to the uh, hospital expenses, she certainly is volunteering to make restitution of all medical expenses that occurred as a result of this 
incident. And again, she will make a statement if you'd like to speak. I would like to start off by saying how completely apologetic I am. I understand how of an inconvenience this has been on the families. The day a lot was going on during that time, and I just panicked. That is the reason of my absence when the police got there. I regret everything that took place, but unfortunately I cannot change the facts. I can only admit to the facts that are proven and took and taken any consequences that I am given. I am glad that the children weren't seriously injured and no one else was. And once again, I am also sorry and also embarrassed. And I am also sorry to the parents for having to go through this scare. And I am carrying this guilt daily with me and I also understand how the parents could feel in this matter. Um, I dream of being, after the Army, I dream of being a pediatrician. I really love kids, and um, sometimes I babysit my little cousins. And just for me hitting people, actual people, it just really frightened me, and I didn't know what to do. I'd never been in any situations like this, and I'm, I'm shaking right now because this is making my character look very poor, and this is not me. And I know that I can't change what happened, but I pray that you forgive me in your heart because this is not me at all. And I don't know my way through the streets. I live in Euclid. I don't know my way through Lake County, so it was difficult on how to just get, to, just get home. The judge remained steadfast and, with a stern expression, delivered the sentence for this young criminal. The sentencing demonstrated that justice is served equally for everyone, regardless of who the person is. 180 days in the Lake County Jail with zero suspended. You'll serve all 180 days in the Lake County Jail. You find that you're not amenable to probation. Your driver's license is suspended for the maximum time that I can suspend it under the law. That's three years. There are no driving privileges. The B count, there'll be a $350 fine in court costs. On the C count, a $150 fine in court costs. On the D count, $150 fine in court costs. Restitution has been requested um, by the state. There is no amount of restitution that has been presented by the court to the court for my consideration at this time. The defendant has indicated that um, she's willing to pay uh, pay restitution, but I don't have any numbers in front of me. I will order restitution, um, and what will happen is, if there's going to be a hearing on that, then uh, Mr. Sweet will file an appropriate motion if we need to discuss what that is. We can do that uh, at, at another time, but I am ordering <coughs> restitution for the victims here. Now, this fellow is... Okay. This <coughs> The 25, the kids, they were on the bus, that's all this happened. So. Judge, uh, to, just to reiterate, on the uh, hit skit, there were six points. And we did recommend eventually the remedial driving with a retesting. The six points will be um, assessed by the BNB. Right, I just wanted yes. to make that clear. Yes. The same. With um, the two points on the B count. That's true. All assessed by the BNB. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Sweet, <coughs> is there anything additional from you? I would only respectfully request that uh, Ms. Wilson be given a brief opportunity to get her affairs in order because she's juggling a lot right now and she has to square herself away with her commitments made to the Army. I would respectfully request a delay in reporting to jail. The request is denied. Ms. Wilson? Is there any way I can get less days? I'm so sorry, but 
it was a complete mistake. And this is... I would never do that on purpose. And I just wish someone could see that. Why would I? If I was really going super fast, those kids would be way more hurt. Way more hurt. Miss Wilson. This behavior, it's, it's not just going around a stop sign where kids are getting on and off a bus. You left them there. You didn't stop. And you left two seven-year-olds on the side of the road. As, as a society, we don't treat each other this way. <coughs> you were so involved in you that you didn't consider anyone else around you. And for that, there is a penalty. And this is it. You are very lucky today in that the two little boys are alive and able to live and hopefully enjoy very long lives. Your error in judgment could have cost two lives here. So the 180 <clears throat> days that you will serve is a reminder as to the fact, the fact that you couldn't focus on anyone but yourself. If there was more time if I could give you more days in jail under the law, I would, because this is the worst form of the offense. Is there anything else? I have nothing further. Thank you. We're adjourned. Let's explore a case where a young man's emotional online confession to a fatal drunk driving crash expressed his readiness to face the consequences. It has been very difficult, but I've seen my boy turn into the man who stands you before you, willing to accept full responsibility and the punishment this court feels is just. On June 22nd, 2013 in Columbus, Vincent Kanzani tragically lost his life over Matthew Cordell's reckless driving. He now feels remorse for his crime in the courtroom. The prosecutor highlighted how the event unfolded. Seemingly, the full-length incident consisted of a huge twist. 2.40 a.m., Your Honor, uh, uh, police officers were called uh, because of a a 911 call that had been uh, made on a wrong, a wrong way driver on the downtown interstate uh, 670. Um, the call indicated there was a white pickup truck uh, heading eastbound in the westbound lanes uh, of I-670 at Neal Avenue. Uh, approximately uh, within minutes, they, uh, it was a supplemental call that the wrong way driver had hit another vehicle head on in the area of 4th Street. Uh, Columbus Fire Heavy Rescue uh, responded to the scene. They found a tan Jeep uh, in which the victim, uh, Vincent Canzani, was located. He was 61 years old. Uh, he was pronounced dead at the scene by the Heavy uh, Rescue Squad. Uh, there was uh, the at-fault at vehicle was a white uh, Toyota Tundra uh, pickup truck. Uh, the, the driver the wrong way. Uh, a vehicle was identified as, as the defendant. There was no other person in or around the area. No passenger in the vehicle. There was no passenger in the vehicle and no indication any other person had been in the vehicle other than uh, the defendant. Uh, he was identified because he was injured and transported uh, to uh, a local medical facility. Uh, he was identified through his driver's license on his person as um, the defendant, Matthew R. Uh, Cordell. Uh, the Vehicle actually had rolled over and was sitting on its roof when the uh, police uh, uh, arrived at the scene. Uh, the vehicle was leaking gasoline, and uh, the officers initially were not able to get close enough because of that uh, to uh, take uh, steps to extricate him from the uh, vehicle. He was fading in and out of consciousness uh, upon their original uh, arrival. He was eventually extracted from the vehicle, transported to a grand uh, ER. Uh, they followed the...
spot. Uh, the police followed the squad to uh, the hospital, both in connection with uh, uh, the defendant. Uh, he was treated in a trauma room at Grant. Um, they were advised he had possible skull fractures and a possible cracked vertebrae. Several members of the hospital staff in the ER advised the police that the defendant was very, very drunk. Uh, advised uh, security staff uh, uh, that he had six beers. Uh, the officer spoke with the defendant in the trauma room. Six beers, what period of time? He didn't state uh, what time period, Your Honor, nor was that amount verified through any independent source. Uh, but he did uh, get interviewed uh, by an officer in the trauma room once he was stabilized. He did say he had a few drinks. Uh, he stated to the officers he was heading home. Uh, the officers asked him if he knew what had happened. Uh, or where he was, and he had been involved in an accident. He, he uh, didn't seem to know they'd been involved in an accident at that point. While they were talking to him, uh, the officers detected a strong odor of an alcohol uh, beverage about his person. Uh, they did that at that point, and advising him that he was involved in a fatal accident, he was responsible for the death of another person. They advised him he was under arrest, advised him of his Miranda rights and his rights under the implied consent law. They attempted to reach the uh, back of that BMV form to him in order to obtain uh, the sample, and he became very irate, irate and began yelling. He didn't kill anyone. He didn't do it, and he wasn't going to give him any uh, uh, blood sample. Um, the medical staff became concerned that he was becoming destabilized, and the officer stopped talking to him. Because of his refusal to cooperate at that time and given the chem chemical sample, the uh, officers uh, contacted Judge Vanderkar from the Franklin County Municipal Court, who was the duty judge, to get a search warrant to compel him to give the blood sample. There was a blood sample. There was a blood sample secured uh, pursuant to a search warrant signed by Judge uh, Vanderkar and uh, an RN at the trauma center at Grant uh, did uh, draw the blood, provided to the police. They sent it to the uh, State Highway Patrol uh, crime lab and it was analyzed with 0.191 blood alcohol. Uh, 1% is 1%. Correct, 0.191. Um, I wanted to uh, indicate that uh, they also interviewed two other uh, drivers that were heading uh, westbound on I-670 uh, at the time of this uh, incident, one of whom uh, had to drive defensively and avert uh, the defendant coming towards him that morning and uh, hit, took their car up onto the uh, uh, berm and hit the uh, wall that's there. There were two women uh, also right behind Mr. Kinzani's uh, Jeep that uh, become, became involved in an accident and were slightly injured that morning as well. They interviewed them about what they had observed with the white truck uh, uh, coming towards them. Uh, the, uh, the judge explained the context of the case to the criminal and what he would face in the future if found guilty. Please disengage that cell phone at this time. Please disengage. All right. The matter before the court is the matter of State of Ohio versus Matthew Cordell. And I want the record to reflect that Mr. Cordell was present with his two counsel, Mr. George Breitmeyer, who's to my right, and Mr. Matthew uh, Marty Median. Present for the State of Ohio are Keith McGrath, and uh, how come you look so younger than, so much younger than uh, Mr. O'Brien. I don't know. It, the color of the hair, I think. And Mr. O'Brien is here. The Franklin County Prosecutor is here representing the state of Ohio. Now, this matter comes before the court this um, 23rd day of October for sentencing. Let me review a few matters. This matter came before the court September the 18th. And on September the 18th, the defendant was present with his counsel, same counsel for the state of Ohio, and the defendant, Matthew Cordell, before this court, entered a plea of two guilties. So let me identify 
uh, the case number for the record. Um, the case number is 13 CR 4732. And on that date in September, September the 18th, Matthew Cordell, the defendant, entered a plea of guilty to two counts. Count one was a felony of the second degree, aggravated vehicular homicide, a felony of the second degree. Moreover, Mr. Cordell entered a plea of guilty to count two, operating a vehicle while impaired, a misdemeanor of the first degree, and a violation of 45-1119. Aggravated vehicular homicide is a felony of the second degree in this state, and operating a vehicle while impaired, 45-1119, is a misdemeanor of the first degree. The court on that date asked for a pre-sentence investigation. The court wanted the benefit of additional information so that I could make an informed decision relative to this sentencing. I asked for a pre-sentence report. Now, as always the case, in addition to the pre-sentence report, which I have reviewed thoroughly and received uh, about a week ago, I received memorandums from the state of Ohio, sentencing memorandums. I received sentencing memorandums from the defendant, and I reviewed those. At the time of this court accepting the plea of guilty to those two, to, to the two counts just uh, identified, I was informed that Mr. Cordell had, on September the third, made a um, a video wherein he acknowledged his guilt to the offenses that were here on this morning. And I was told that this uh, video was placed on YouTube. I didn't have the slightest idea what YouTube was, but my secretary told me. It sounded like an outpatient procedure to me, YouTube, but um, my secretary uh, gave me that information of what YouTube was. And since um, that was made, I have had the opportunity to view that uh, at least three times. I viewed it uh, initially, and then I wanted to go back and look at it again, and then I wanted to go back and look at it again, and I think the most recent uh, viewing of that uh, video was last Friday. The court gives the victim's family a chance to speak before the perpetrator is sentenced. Angela Kanzani, last name C-A-N-Z-A-N-I. Good morning. Thank you. Vincent Kanzani was my father. He had two daughters and five grandchildren. My father was a man that had an impact on everyone he knew and touched the lives of many. He was a talented photographer and artist and enjoyed working out and being with people he cared about. My sister Marie and I will never see our father's face again. Our children will never see their grandfather again. We will never hear his voice, we will never hug him, and we will never look forward to another holiday with our dad grandpa. I've heard time and time again about a message, but the message I do not want to send is if you hit and kill someone, all you have to do is admit to it later and get leniency. I hope Matthew Cordell does raise awareness after he does this time and does it sincerely by going to schools, etc., not publicly. My father got a death sentence and did nothing wrong. Eight and a half years is nothing. Less than that would be unjust. After eight and a half years, Matthew Court will still have his whole life ahead of him. My dad is never coming back. Thank you. Thank you.
Mr. McGrath, is there anyone else that you uh, <coughs> wish to have speak to the court? No, Your Honor. All right. Mr. Breitmeyer, Mr. Minion, is there anyone that you wish to have uh, speak to this court, please? Yes, sir, Your Honor. Matthew's father, David, would like to make a statement. Okay. Check off the podium. Mr. Cordo, if you'll come forward. It is Mr. Cordo, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir I'd like for you to uh, give us your full name. And for the record, please spell your last name. My name is Dave Cordo. Last name C O R D L E. I was doing pretty well until you played that video. I'm sorry? I said I was doing pretty well until you played that video. It gets me every time. Um, I am Dave Cordell. Matt Cordell is my son. His mother, Carrie, his sister, Sarah, Grace, Paige, brother-in-law, E. Care, my wife, Ellen, and I are here to support Matt and your decision, Judge Feist. All of us are deeply saddened by the horrific events on June 22nd the night Vincent Canzani was killed. I am very disappointed, disgusted, and heartbroken in the choices Matthew made that tragic night. Choices that have ch changed two families forever. It has been very difficult, but I've seen my boy turn into the man who stands you before you, willing to accept full responsibility in the punishment this court feels is just. This is not about glorifying Matthew or to get a lighter sentence. No, it's simply to do the right thing and honor Vincent Canzani's life by speaking the truth and sparing the Canzani family the ordeals of a trial. I believe my son's mission in life will be to spread and share the, this tragic experience with as many as possible to change others' attitudes and spare them the consequences of Matt's fate. If Matt can save just one victim, like Vincent, then Matt truly knows his time incarcerated will have been beneficial. I cannot begin to tell you how many letters, text messages, Facebook postings, and phone calls we have received in response to Matt's message. Complete strangers have made contact sharing their stories and were so moved by Matt's message that they also made the promise to never drink and drive again. To Angela and the Kanzani family, my heart is filled with sorrow for your loss. I cannot express enough our deepest sympathy for the pain and anger you must feel. My hope is someday soon you will be able to overcome this tragedy, find peace of mind, open your heart, and begin the healing process, and then and when you are able to, forgive my son Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. The judge considers the criminal's past, the crime's severity, the proof, and the motive when sentencing. The same happened here. Relative to sentencing, I'm going to proceed with 13 CR 4732. What is the jail time credit, gentlemen, on, uh, on this 45 case? 45 days, Your Honor. We stipulated 45 days. 45 days. Now, my sentence is going to be as follows. I'm going to impose sentences on both counts. And let me explain to you why. I think there needs to be an explanation. I'm going to impose a sentence on count two, and I'm going to impose a sentence on count one. And those sentences will run consecutive, and I'll tell you why. I think it's appropriate to impose a sentence on the OVI because the OVI is the genesis of why we're here today. Had Mr. Cordell not been driving that vehicle on that early morning under the influence, we wouldn't be here. The, um, the sine qua non, and for those of you who do not take Latin as that for which not, is the OVI. So relative to count one, excuse me, relative to count two, the court imposed a sentence as follows. Six months to the Franklin County Correctional Center. The court imposes a fine of $1,075 
and the court costs. Pursuant to the statute, the driving privileges are suspended for a period of three years. That pertains to count two. The court has imposed a sentence of six months to the Franklin County Correctional Center. Now, relative to count one, count one is the offense aggravated vehicle homicide, a felony of the second degree, 2903.06. The court imposes the following. The court imposes a sentence of six years to the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation Corrections. A sentence of six years. The driving privileges, it's a lifetime suspension. The court costs are imposed. And the court is going to order that counts two and one run consecutive. The court has, for all intents and purposes, imposed a sentence of six and a half years. Now, the order of the court is this. Mr. Cordo is to satisfy the six month sentence in the Franklin County Correctional Center. I'm going to award the jail time credit on that count, count two. The jail time credit will be awarded on count two. And after he completes that sentence, he'll be transferred to the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation Corrections where he'll complete the sentence of six years. I'm going to also order that the court costs on both cases and the fine that was imposed be deferred, be deferred, not suspended, but deferred until Mr. Cordo is released. Mr. Cordo, I want to advise you that having imposed that sentence relative to the felony, after you are released from prison, you will, it's mandatory because that's the statute. You will have a period of post-release control for a period of three years. If you violate a post-release control sanction, any one of the following may result. There are four, and they are as follows. One, the parole board may impose a more restrictive post-release control sanction. Two, the parole board may increase, lengthen the duration of the post-release control subject to a specified maximum. Thirdly, the more restrictive sanction that the parole board may impose may consist of a prison term, provided that the prisoner cannot exceed nine months and the maximum cumulative prison term so imposed for all violations during the period of post-release control cannot exceed one half of the stated prison originally imposed upon you. Lastly, fourthly, if the violation of the sanction is a felony offense, you may be prosecuted for the felony offense and in addition to any sentence it imposes on you for the new felony offense, the court may impose a prison term subject to a specified maximum for the violation. Do you have any questions? No, Your Honor. Some people will think that that sentence was too lenient. Some people will think that that sentence was too harsh. This court has reviewed this matter thoroughly, thoroughly, and the court feels that the sentence just imposed is the appropriate sentence. Good luck, Mr. Corwin. Thank you, Your Honor. And good luck to the consent. Buckle up to witness the tragic case of this individual, whose drunk driving claimed two lives and left her in grief for the rest of her life. I've had to completely rethink and everything that I had, knowing all of our plans. On August 2nd, 2016, in Texas, Shauna Elliott drove while intoxicated, crashed, and claimed the lives of Christian Guerrero's husband, Fabian Guerrero, and their unborn child. This woman will now see the outcome of drunk driving in court. It's hard for a mother to lose both her child and her husband in an unacceptable way. The courtroom saw the immense pain this mother was going through when she testified about the incident. And you delivered four days after you were told he was deceased. Yes, I had to hold him in my body for days. After you gave birth, um, did you do anything with Fabian James? I got to hold him. I got to look at him.
Do you need a break? <laughs> Your Honor, can we take a recess, please? Um, after you got the whole Fabian James, um, what happened? I, I got to hold him for, or I got to keep him in the room for a couple hours. Um, got to look at his little features, and at that point, he had already shown his evidence to his father. He looked just like my husband. Got to look at his little feet, at his hands, and then they took him. Do you know what happened to him after he was open? I know that he, um, he took his little fingerprints and his footprints for a keepsake box for me, and then I believe they sent him with the baby. Um, and when you say they, are you talking about the hospital staff? Yes. At some point in time, did you have a funeral for both? Uh, your husband, baby, or, uh, Moreno Guerrero, and baby James. Yes. Uh, how long after the accident did that occur? About a week or close to a week. And seems like a, a silly question, but you were there, correct? Yes, I organized everything. Um, actually, the day that I had came home from the hospital that Sunday, I immediately went to the funeral home to start the process. And, and do you remember what day that was? I just remember it was this, uh, Sunday. Do you remember what day the accident was? What day of the week? On a Tuesday. <clears throat> do you remember about the time, what, what, what time the accident occurred? Around six. Did they ever be a PM? So, as soon as you got discharged from the hospital, you started planning a funeral? Yes. Well, should I say two funerals? It was a joint funeral. So, they were buried at the same time? Yes, they were buried together. There was a, a small coffin that resembles the coffin that we had picked out for my husband, and it was placed in his arms. Um, was Fabian's casket open, or Fabian, uh, your husband's casket, casket open or closed? It was open. And who attended? All of his friends, all of his family, we had a whole community because my husband was very well known. Did that occur in Brian? Yes, sir. How's your life been since this? Everything's different. Everything. I I don't live in the same place. I don't go to the same places anymore. I'm different. My relationships with my friends and family are different because I can't be the same person I was before. I can't be available to my friends and family because of this pain. I've had to move. I've had to completely rethink and everything that I had, knowing all of our plans. Why did you move? Because I couldn't stay in, in our home by myself. <laughs> Did it remind you of him? Everything reminds me of him everywhere. But yes, it's just overwhelming in our home. And it's March 6, 2018. Do you still feel that way? Yes. I still feel like this is just a really, really bad dream. And that my husband's just gonna come home. But he's not. What could intoxication do to a person? This criminal became a perfect example of what could go wrong. A college kid, would you smoke marijuana? Yes. Okay, and would you use drugs? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and Robert as well. He would use drugs as well? Yes. Okay. 
you and he are charged with criminal offenses arising out of that search of the house. Whose drugs were they? Robert Pullman's. Um, it's not to say that you weren't using drugs, but he was the drug dealer, right? Yes. Okay. In fact, when they came in and searched the house, they were looking for him, right? Yes. Uh, we've heard discussions about room one and room two in that house. One had a bunch of girls' clothes in it. One had a bunch of guys' clothes in it. One room looked kind of girly with the plant. Um, Robert doesn't strike me as the plant kind of guy. Did he live in room one? Yes. Was it his safe? Yes. Was it his money? Yes. Were they his drugs? Yes. And you lived in room two? Yes. The Or that was where your possessions were, that was your domain? Yes. You notice on the photographs uh, in room two, there were clo uh, clothes piled up uh, on the bed uh, at the time those photographs were taken. The prosecutor asked that the officer uh, if it looked like it had been slept in. He says, well, not recently or something to that effect. Um, why were there clothes on the bed? I was actually doing laundry that morning. Okay, so the, the clothes were folded and on top of your bed? Yes. Okay. When they came in, now you understand you're not on trial today for the drug cases, right? Yes. Okay, and, and those are the cases that Robert's already gotten some probation and some dismissals on, right? Yes. Okay. When they came in, they were kind of, uh, the first search, they were kind of surprised, I guess, that you were there or they weren't looking for you, right? Right. Okay. Since that search of your house, did you make a decision about whether or not to use drugs? I did. Okay, and what was that decision? To get sober. Okay. And did you do so? I did. Okay. Um, now, sobriety isn't a straight line, yeah. so uh, it's not to say you wouldn't use every now and again, right? Right. Okay. But since that arrest, um, you hired an attorney, Mr. Wink, yeah. I believe, and he told you, hey, look, um, Robert's the bad guy. Um, and I want both y'all to, I want you to start doing UAs, urine analysis, uh, so we can show that you're not doing drugs, right? Right. And you did that, right? Yes. Okay. And so, and your UAs, were, did they come back negative, meaning there's no presence of drugs? Yes, they're all negative except for the uh, benzopiedine, which is my uh, prescription, clonazepam. Clonazepam. Yes. jumping back and forth in time. Um, you and Robert were in an accident, a car accident, uh, back in June of 2015, weren't you? Yes. Okay, describe that to the jury. Who was driving? Um, Robert was driving and... Um, you want to tell me approach? Okay, sure. <coughs> Y'all were involved in, a, in an accident. Were you were you injured? Yes. Um, and as a result of that injury, did you get a prescription for hydrocodone? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, and were you able to stop taking hydrocodone? Um, How did you stop using hydrocodone? I was prescribed the pain pills, which led me to my addiction of heroin. Okay. But you were able to get off the opioid. We'll call them opioids. Yes, after um, the first arrest. The court also provides an equal chance for the criminals to testify and confess to their wrongdoings. The same thing happened here, too. Your surrogate mom is here, right? Yes. Miss Haynes, if you got out, if, whenever you get out, 
okay? Whenever you get out. Um, will you go stay with Miss Haynes? Yes. Go abide by her rules? Yes. Is there anything else you want to tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Is there anything you want to tell them? I just want to say that <laughs> I want to say to the victim's family that I'm sorry from the deepest of my heart and I know an apology doesn't do much. I know it doesn't. <laughs> but I pray for forgiveness every day. And to the jury, I just Hope that you can find it in your hearts. Whatever's fair for y'all, whatever y'all punishment, I'm accepting of it because I accept responsibility and I know what I did was wrong. Anything else? No. Absolutely. Do you need a moment, Miss Elliot? <coughs> okay. Okay. Um, talk first about your psychological diagnoses. Okay. If I understand it correctly, it's depression, anxiety, and then sub-anxiety with PTSD. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you agree with me that a lot of people out there are probably walking around with those disorders? Most definitely. Okay. And your father, he passed away when you were 16. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And it was a heart attack, right? Yes. Okay. And it wasn't a gunshot or anything like that? No. Well, you have my condolences for that, Miss Elliot. Um, would you agree with me, though, that a lot of people probably have their fathers pass away and are walking around out there? Yes. And it doesn't sound like you had an easy time with your mother growing up, is that right? No. Okay. Would you agree with me that a lot of people out there probably had some pretty bad moms running around out there? I agree. Maybe there are some people who, you know, are in your exact same boat and ha had, had combinations of all three of those happen. Yes, or worse. Or worse, you know. Doesn't sound like your situation with your stepfather was pretty easy, is that right? No. Okay. And just want to be clear, you know, not, not to, to say that what, what you went through with your stepfather wasn't serious, it sounds like it was, but it wasn't like physical or s right? No. It was just, it, it was emotional and, and verbal, is that right? Yes. Okay. Probably lots of people out there in that boat right, too, right? Yes. Okay. How many of those people do you think killed two individuals and ruined a third's life? I can't say, so I don't know. Probably a lot of people out there with those kind of factors in their lives who don't make the decisions you did on August 2nd, 2016. Is that right? That's right. The drugs you, you were using, you, are, you already mentioned heroin, right? Yes. Okay. Were you using methamphetamine? No. Were you using marijuana? Yes. When in fact, that, that's what rolling papers are for, right? Marijuana? Yes. Okay. Let's talk a, a, a little bit more about you growing up, um, you, you went to, to elementary, middle, and high school, right? Yes. Okay. Were there any presentations about drunk driving or drug use and how they're bad that you remember? No. Okay. Do you remember seeing any sort of advertisements on television about how drunk driving ruins lives and things like that? Yes. You know, anything on the internet to, to that effect? Yes. Okay. Um, in that accident in 2015, Mr. Poland was driving, right? Yes. What happened there? Um, an elderly couple ran a stop sign and uh, we were on the highway and they T-boned us. So you were the victim in that incident, right? I guess you could say. And that incident kind of, did it, it, it seems like it left an impression in your mind about the importance of, of driving safely, right? Yes. And August 2nd, 2016, that wasn't the first time you had drank alcohol before, right? No. Okay. You pointed it out in, in the video during the hospital that you're, you, at the time you were 105 pounds, you drank two beers, you're going to be drunk, right? Yes. Okay. So is it fair to say you knew 
the consequences of making the decision on August 2nd, 2016 that you did before you made that decision? Yes. And you did it anyways. Yes. The judge tried to gather every piece of evidence before delivering a sentence. You got it. You got it, I think so. I think okay. Someone write as bad as I do, that's a problem. <laughs> Here we are. Must be a guy. Uh, Here we are. All right, bring it in. I'm sorry? Is that her? No, that's not her. Uh, you, They're walking down the hall right now. Yeah, we don't need to delay. We'll, we'll wait till they get here before we take the verdict. Please be seated. Court's back in session. Let the record reflect. The defendant is present in open court with counsel. The DA is present and the 12 jurors are present. Mr. Rios, would you hand the verdict form to the bailiff, please? Yes, Your Honor. Can you assure me it's a unanimous verdict as to all three counts? It is. Thank you. After considering all the arguments, the judge reached a decision in favor of justice for the victim. Count one, intoxication assault. Check on the first line, confinement by, sex, by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of 10 years, enter a number, yeah, 10 years, and no fine. And having, having assessed punishment at no more than 10 years confinement, you further find the defendant has never been convicted of a felony and recommends she be placed on community supervision. That's as to count one. And they recommend suspension of the term of confinement only. So they didn't specify that makes sense. As do count two. Verdict of the jury count two intoxication manslaughter, no recommendation of community supervision. Check the first line confinement by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of seven years and no fine. Signed by the foreman, four person, and count three. They again check the first one, and again it's seven years. Seven years confinement, no, no probation, and no fine. And the foreman has assured me it's a unanimous verdict. That said, does either side wish to have the jury told? We do not, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Very well. Then that on the assurance of the foreman it's a unanimous verdict, I will pronounce it in a unanimous verdict and sentence the defendant in accordance with that verdict. As for count one, two. I can remember, but I need to be reading it when I do it, so I can mess it up. As to count one, she is sentenced to ten years confinement in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Institutional Revision. That sentence will be and there'll be no fine. That sentence will be suspended and probated for a term of 10 years. And counts two and three, uh, accepting the jury's verdict on each counts two and three, I will uh, assess her punishment at seven years confinement on each count. 
now on, on whether or not to run concurrently or consecutively. I think you have a right to a precinct investigation report if you want one. We do, Your Honor. We do request that. Very well. Would somebody know yeah. the probation? We do, Your Honor. All right. Your Honor. When the, when the probation officer gets here, what? Pardon me? I think it's optional within the discretion of the court under uh, Section 42 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. And given that the defendant is being incarcerated, uh, I would urge the court to hold off on that. If for no other reason, we've got some victims who would like to allocute, and, and, it, and it would be a great burden for them to have to come back in six to eight weeks uh, in the middle of a regular free trial docket to do that. They can allocute today. We can use them All right. I don't know what Code of Criminal Procedure you're reading, but. They definitely can do their allocution today. Uh, I'm not taking under advisement whether or not to stack the sentences. I, it occurs to me, though, that it's not the jury's intention that that occur, and that's going to weigh pretty heavily with me. Yes. Uh, but you are entitled to a PSI, so if you want one, we'll, we'll make sure there is one. Yes, sir. Okay? Granted. That will be taken under advisement then as to the whether they're consecutive or concurrent until the PSI is prepared. In the driver's seat, lives hang in the balance. Forgetting this leads to dire consequences, as we'll see in this case. Uh, Ms. Carr, I'm uh, required to advise you that upon release from prison in this case, you will be placed for three years on what is known as post-release control. And that under that, the parole authority can return you to prison for violating conditions of post-release control. On June 6, 2019, Sharon Carr fatally struck Randy Nylans on the side of a road and fled the scene hurriedly. Now she faces the court for her crime. The defendant tried to convince the judge by stating his client's apology for her crime, but the judge remained resolute in his decision. Mr. Milano, Ms. Carr, in light of the large crowd, I usually, when I have bigger crowds for particular sentencing, I usually have the parties handle that from their trial table rather than coming before the court reporter, and that's how I assume uh, uh, are, how I expect us to do this today. Uh, uh, Mr. Milano, this is your opportunity uh, to relate anything, although, as I said, I've reviewed the sentencing memorandum that you submitted to the courts er earlier this week. Uh, 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 the agreement at the time of the plea was that the court would be issuing a three-and-a-half-year prison sentence with regard to this matter and that the defendant would not be eligible for judicial release. Uh, I believe she wouldn't have been eligible for judicial release with regard to count one uh, anyway, if I recall correctly, but um, I can confirm that with a quick review of the pre-sentence uh, report, or excuse me, the plea sheets. Um, yes, that, that case, that charge is one in which the uh, prison sentence is mandatory. Uh, the court has reviewed the pre-sentence report with regard to this matter. I appreciate that it also had a, a good deal of publicity, although generally speaking, I don't read the local papers. Uh, about cases that might end up in my court. Uh, I guess I sort of stick with uh, the comics, the uh, sports, and the editorial section. Uh, so I've not had the benefit of uh, review of any kind of uh, media coverage or detriment from media coverage, I suppose, is a possibility as well. Um, uh, you may uh, proceed with your statement on behalf of Ms. Carr, sir. Thank you, Judge. Judge, it's... it's it's not my intention to apologize for Mrs. Carr because she has done that in writing. I believe she gave her an opportunity to speak. She would have apologized today. Um, I do think um, that it's necessary for me to do two things. Uh, first, to note that Mrs. Carr uh, is being punished and that she should be. Uh, she did a terrible thing. She caused Mr. Nyland's death. It's a terrible thing. The pain that she caused their family. His family is a terrible thing. Uh, the note that I just want to make is that all that being said, all understanding that there's nothing that she can do to make it better, uh, she understands that punishment is necessary, that three and a half years is necessary, but will never make up for the loss that she caused. Uh, but the note I'd like to make as judge is that she herself is not a terrible person. She's 65 years old, I think, or maybe 64. As you know, she's out of Walker because she had a hip replaced um, just before the Christmas holiday. Uh, we we're asking you to extend the time for her to report because the doctor was late and she needs another some more time to recover. Uh, what's, so what's the doctor's expectation in that regard, Mr. Milano? We believe that she should report on the 17th and that she will have had enough time at that point. Hmm? February 17th. Right, thank you. That she will have enough time at that point 
uh, to recover the way she would have when we set this date. But unfortunately, Judge, uh, good people, and she's lived an absolutely worthwhile life, she was just beginning retirement, good people sometimes do terrible things and cause terrible consequences. The second thing that she would like me to do uh, is to thank everyone involved in this case as a case, uh, starting with the Nylons family, but also the state, the prosecutors, the court, the police, uh, for the incredible empathy and balance and fairness with which she was treated. Uh, it was, uh, it, it, it is, it was an, it's an extraordinary thing. Of course, it's what's due of all of us. Uh, but she really wants to thank everyone for the fairness for, with which she's been treated. Uh, she understands fully the punishment is necessary. The punishment is just. Uh, but again, and finally, uh, she'll express her sorrow. I've lived with it with her since the day we met. She's written it. Um, and the idea of how she was treated, it was important for her to make sure that everybody understands that going to jail is the consequence for what she did. Uh, thank you, Judge. Thank you, Mr. Milano. Uh, Ms. Carr, do you have anything you wish to say on your own behalf before this court proceeds with sentencing in this matter? The victim's family members expressed their deepest sorrow after losing one of their members. Did the criminal feel any regret for her heinous action? I was really attached to her months of what seems like never-ending proceedings to get us to this day. Every time we have to come here, we have to relive the night of the sixth again. It's torture. I mean, how can someone so good be taken away from us like this? My like dad had more integrity than anyone has ever known. He wouldn't hurt a soul. He was always there for us. I could always come him. From the time I was little, he was there for the small things and the big things. I was a total daddy's girl, and proudly so. I called him whenever I had a question about anything. He tolerated many hard questions, often pointing me to the manual so I could learn rather than be given all the answers. He taught me the basics of being handy around the house with some tools. And he was my resident handyman for all the projects in the home I have with my husband. He spent countless hours helping my husband update things in our home. He gave me my first real job the summer I turned 16. I helped fill out with our employee and I got to practice my driving hours. How lucky was I? I had to spend time with him. I actually enjoyed working with him and spending time in his office. He taught me how to drive a stick shift and didn't get worked up when I stalled out in the middle of a very busy intersection named Rumley. Sometimes at the patients of the seat. When I worked on an office renovation several years ago, he was my person. It was so much fun to share with him what was happening and the different design elements, something we could fully relate on. Earlier in 2019, he was my person again for an office move with my company. I was so excited to show him our new building downtown because he hadn't yet been in it. We moved in a couple weeks ago, but I don't have to share it with him now. We all suffer the consequences of this car's actions. I'm not the same person I was on June 5th. I don't know that I ever will be, but I'm doing my best to get back there, attending therapy to aid in the process. I constantly worry about my mom. Is she okay? What can I do? I don't want to take her finger away. Nothing I can do will ever make any of this change. I worry about my brother. He's so far away. How is he coping? Is he taking care of himself? I'm his big sister and I want to protect him. My husband bears the brunt of my sadness, guilt, fear, and anxiety. He too has suffered this loss. But am I recognizing that enough? The friend of my children, they're too young to really understand this fully. But they miss him, but they're sad by this huge loss. And I'm making sure that they're really okay. I dread the day when I have to tell them the full truth of how their grandfather died. The only reason he isn't here is because someone made some very horrible decisions, and they're solely responsible for his tragic death. He took him away from his next chapter. He and Mom were getting closer to retiring and had plans to enjoy every part of what they had to offer. Naively, I thought my dad would live into his 90s, as both his parents did. I thought he would experience so much more with me. I could only hope my children would have the same experience as I did, having grandparents who had lived so long, perhaps even having their own children, while he was still alive, like I was able to. He didn't even get to see my youngest daughter turn one. All of the hopes and dreams I had had like this were taken away from me in an instant. 
I won't get to have any more conversations with him. I won't be able to ask him how many more questions about cars or architecture or buildings or DIY projects. I won't get to hear his voice or his laugh. I won't be able to call him in the middle of the work day and ask him what he's up to and hear his response and his coloring pictures and cutting out paper dolls. I won't hear another early morning call from him on my birthday to be the first to wish me a happy birthday because he was always the first person to call me. I won't hear his silly laugh, his dad jokes, his next car quest, or a story about another sailing adventure. There won't be any more family group texts with him. I, along with my family, will make sure that who my dad was as a person will always be known. There isn't anyone that can take away his legacy. He was too good of a man for that. His love of family, friends, and community, his commitment to helping others, and his integrity was worth more than gold and will always remain. I will always have my blessings and be grateful for every moment I have with the most amazing father that anyone could have been My dad will live in through all of us. Thank you. Ms. Gilgris, what did your father do for a living? He's an architect. Architect? Thank you. Mr. Kern? Thank you. What's that? Hey, thank you. Anna? If you could, in just a moment, uh, Mrs. Nylands. And uh, um, my court reporter would like copies of any of the statements made by the individuals uh, so that it, it can be uh, uh, kept by the court. She's the one who keeps, at least initially in this room, the, the records. And then, so if we need uh, photocopies, maybe we'll do it in our office, but we appreciate your effort in that regard. Mrs. Nylands, if you could please, uh, if you could state your full name. My name is um, Patricia Nylands, I go by Patty. Thank you, Mrs. Nylands, and I'm sorry uh, you're forced to speak at this difficult time, but please, I'm, I, I'm listening. I am the widow of Randy Nylands. I would like to make my victim impact statement today, and with your permission, Your Honor, I will direct my statement to the court, the defendant, and her attorney. The prosecutor meticulously outlined the sequence of events leading to the alleged crime, while the defendant's lawyer countered with evidence challenging the prosecution's claims. No one's saying that Sharon Carr is some career criminal. No one's saying that she went out that night intending to kill. But if this case is a, a lesson, it's a lesson that actions have consequences. It's a lesson that driving drunk can have very serious consequences. It's a lesson that not leaving space for bikes on the side of the road, especially when there's a designated bike lane that the bicyclist is riding in, has consequences. It's a lesson that not stopping after a collision has consequences. It's a lesson that being so impaired that you don't even know that you hit somebody, and when pulled over, you have no idea why, when the front end of your car is horribly damaged, the front passenger mirror uh, on, on her SUV was essentially ripped off from this collision. Being so impaired you don't know that has consequences. And being so impaired that you weave into the bike lane, one witness in this case described her weaving into the lane five or six times before striking Randy Niles on the side of the road. There are consequences for that, and the consequence is that bad things happen to good people. The consequence is that people die. And this case is about ensuring that Mrs. Carr, the community, and the Nihil's family know there are consequences for what Mrs. Carr did. And that's why the parties have agreed to recommend, I expect you will impose three and a half years of prison in this case, with no opportunity for judicial release. That three-year term on count one would be mandatory time anyways under the statute, but the additional six months on count three is also going to be no opportunity for judicial release per our agreement.
as an insurance uh, in this case, as well as a separate civil matter. So I would like to do that as I can. Right. 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 Thank you, uh, folks. Yes, Mr. Milano. May I have just one moment before you proceed? You may. I only want to address one thing The idea that this car by her not guilty for late is here. Uh, Mr. Curran, as he has been throughout this entire case, I thought was enormously fair a moment ago when he said that at the very first pre-trial, which is the first time that we got to meet, the first thing that was said was, this is not a case about whether it was Carr did this or should be punished for it, for it, it just it was a sentencing case and what the punishment should be. And all I want to make clear is is that she did not do it. And to the extent that I was responsible for the fact that she didn't talk to the family as she walked through because I thought that's the way it would do it, that's my fault, not hers. She wrote the first letter of apology in the beginning. And I'm not trying to minimize, of course I'm not trying to do it. But I think that's important to know because when we who work in this world, in this world, uh, had a case, it just takes time to do the job. Uh, it was not meant to be a delay. It was There was never a threat, oh my God, we're going to try this case and put you through the help. It was just a matter of all of us doing our job. So again, I greatly appreciate the fairness, and I particularly appreciate the fairness of Mr. Kern, as he mentioned that. At least we can all understand that it doesn't minimize anything what happened. Mr. Nyland's death, the family's death, is the only thing that really counts here. But at least that should be understood. Again, I appreciate Mr. Kundu, and thanks for the time. Thank you, Mr. Milano. In that regard, I, I know we have a full courtroom, and quite often in, in, uh, in my experience, uh, people who support one side end up on one side of the courtroom, and the people who support the other side uh, support the other side. That seems to be the common occurrence. I don't know. Uh, can I have, if only by a show of hands, how many people are here, ostensibly on behalf of Mr. Nylands? And on behalf of Ms. Carr, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the uh, I'm in my last term. I, I've, I've made that well known for some period of time. And obviously this is not about me, but Many times that uh, people ask, well, how can you leave the bench that early? How can you leave early? These are the types of cases uh, that uh, make it easy to leave early, I suppose. Upon hearing both sides' heated arguments, the judge finally reached for sentencing, which was appropriate for this ruthless crime. I would only suggest if there's anything that anybody can get from this situation that's a positive, it's a recognition that we don't know how long we're here, and we better make sure that our friends and our family know how important we are to each other. Defendant appeared in court for sentencing after having pled guilty to and been found guilty of two counts of aggravated vehicular homicide, count one being a felony of the second degree and count two being a felony of the third degree. Failing to stop after an accident, the felony four and operating a vehicle while under the influence of misdemeanor of the first degree. With regard to count one, there is, uh, it is mandatory time. There is no consideration by the court with regard to the issue of sentencing factors. Court will be issuing consecutive sentences between count one and count three, and I specifically find that Although there is a presumption that all terms are to be served concurrently, this court will be imposing uh, consecutive sentences because they are necessary to sufficiently punish uh, uh, the defendant and are not disproportionate to the acts of the defendant. And in particularly with regard to count three, which is the sentence I'm running uh, consecutively, the court finds that the harm is so great or unusual that a single term with regard to only uh, all of the counts does not adequately reflect the seriousness of the conduct. This is uh, um, particularly so in light of the fact that many of the family members noted the 
uh, additional uh, harm caused to them as a result of the individual who struck their father on the bicycle, uh, struck their uh, family member, uh, departed the scene. And that's why I'm going to be running that consecutive uh, uh, to the sentence issued with regard to count one. Uh, Ms. Carr, I'm uh, required to advise you that upon release from prison in this case, you will be placed for three years on what is known as post-release control. And that under that, the parole authority can return you to prison for violating conditions of post-release control. The maximum they can return you to prison for is one half of the prison term I impose. And since you know I'm imposing a three and a half year prison sentence, that means you'll be facing a uh, three and a half is, uh, let's see, a 36 and 6, 42, a 21 month prison sentence if you violate community, uh, uh, violate post release control. If you do violate, uh, a sanction is uh, not allowed to be any greater than nine months in prison, but so understand that the total amount of time you can serve in prison for, a via for violations equals one half of the sentence or 21 months. Also understand if you commit a felony while on uh, post-release control, you can be returned to prison for that felony plus serve time, excuse me, you can serve the time for the violation of post-release control plus serve time for the new felony. Upon consideration of all matters set forth by laws of judgment law and sentence of the court, defendant be sentenced on count one to three years in prison. On count two, no sentence due to election by the state of Ohio, that count merges with count one. On count three, six months in prison, and on count four, 90 days in jail, and a fine of $375. The sentence issued on count three is to be served consecutively to all other sentences, and the other sentences are to be served concurrently. The court will grant credit with for all days served with regard to this matter uh, up to today's date. Uh, plus, the defendant is entitled to future custody days while she waits transportation to the state institution. The court is going to order and allow defendants uh, uh, to have an, a, a reporting date to the Lorraine County Jail uh, no later than February 17th by 12 o'clock noon. 2 20 by the way. Just one moment. Now, Ms. Carr, I understand that that's going to be probably the worst uh, uh, or at least one of the scariest experiences you're going to confront. Um, when I set up a report date, because when I file my sentencing entries, I have no longer any jurisdiction with regard to this matter, um, uh, I will not be filing the sentencing entry until you report to the Lorraine County Jail. If you fail to report by noon on February 17, 2020, uh, then I would issue a KPS for your arrest, uh, and uh, upon uh, uh, arrest, we would schedule a resentencing with regard to this matter. Today's cases prove that the innocent have nothing to fear, but the guilty will face the court's relentless, crippling justice. To unlock more thrilling court dramas like these, hit the subscribe button.